changed. The button just moved. It's updated. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, I want to start by lighting a candle on this funny little altar I have beside me. It's um, it's a green and purple bandana with a little beeswax tea candle on it. And so a candle for for light on this dark day. Um, I've been feeling like calling on Avalokiteshvara, who's the Bodhisattva of compassion, um, who like hears the cries of the world and responds to them. Um, and so I, <laughs> I drew this artful representation <laughs> of Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> It's like a being with like a bunch of arms reaching out in all directions because drawn in ink on a little piece of paper because um, Avalokiteshvara is often represented as having like many, many arms with tools um, in order to help people with whatever they need. Um, so yeah, I wanted to invoke Avalokiteshvara because, you know, given the incredible amount of like fear and grief and violence that we are witnessing in the world every day, you know? Um, I also have a leaf on this little altar that represents impermanence and a persimmon, this beautiful fruit um, that represents like joy and pleasure and love. And the two themes that I was really feeling in preparing for this talk are impermanence and love. Okay, so while I've been in Montreal, it's now been a week, I have really been enjoying wandering the familiar streets, you know, like, and I've been very aware of how the darkness um, invites me to slow down, to rest, to go to bed early. Like, even though I teleported here on a plane from California, so three hours, three hours behind, very quickly upon arriving, I feel like my body adjusted to the darkness and I wanted to go to bed at like nine, which would have been 6 p.m. in California and ridiculous. But somehow I feel like being in the dark, like walking around the streets from like four to 6 p.m. really like slowed me down and had me adjust to this place pretty rapidly. Um, and so the winter solstice this year technically falls on Friday. Um, and on Friday, the sun will rise at 7.33 a.m. and will set at 4.15 p.m., meaning that there will be about 14 hours of darkness that day, which is, you know, the, a, a really long dark that day. Um, it's the shortest day of the year, after which point the days will slowly start to grow longer. and um, Today, the daylight is only seven seconds longer than it will be on Friday, right? <laughs> so it feels right, it feels apt to be feeling into darkness and light because we're like at this time, even though it's not the real solstice, because we're like still very much like in it, right? At this, at this moment. I looked up the word solstice and um, it's derived from the Latin for sol, which means sun. Um, and sistere, I don't know how to pronounce Latin, but anyway, that means to stand still. So sun standing still. Um, because on the solstice, the sun appears to pause at its northern limit, right? Bef the northern limit of its path before changing direction. And so tonight, I would like to invite a spirit of pause, like a spirit of rest, um, a spirit of stillness, and to really invite noticing of what happens when we, when we allow ourselves to rest and be still. So we will start by sitting for a few minutes, um, and then I'll talk some more, and then we'll sit longer. Yeah, so that's the plan. So I invite you to find a posture, really a posture of any kind, in which to practice um, 
a posture in which you feel supported and comfortable enough. You know, knowing that perfect comfort might not be findable in your body tonight or ever, really, you know. And take the time to really find and settle into a posture that feels that feels right in your body. You know, be it sitting like most of you are doing, standing if you feel sleepy, or even or lying down. And people often begin by, you know, establishing a stable base with your butt on a cushion, knees touching the ground if your legs are crossed, sort of forming a tripod, very stable shape. Um, if you're sitting on a chair, sitting on the edge of the seat, having your feet firmly planted on the ground, your spine upright, head gently lifting, shoulders relaxed and rolled back so that you have a, an open heart, like an open chest and a, a soft belly. Yeah, so finding a posture that's awake and open and receptive and relaxed. And then taking a mindful breath and letting it go. And taking another mindful breath and letting it go. So beginning to land in the body and in this space together. And bringing awareness to the points of contact between your body and what's underneath you. So carpet, couch, chair, floor. And then dropping awareness even further down to the earth the earth who is our mother, like who literally pulls us towards her and supports us at all times. And remembering that our bodies are made of the earth, built from everything we eat, you know, and our skeletons that provide structure and support against gravity are full of minerals from the earth. Just like noticing that you have teeth. <laughs> and our bodies are full of water. Like every cell is bathed in water. And this is the same water that falls as rain and flows in rivers. So noticing the, the wetness of the mouth the liquid bathing the eyeballs. And our bodies are warm like the sun. Noticing the temperature of the hands compared to the ambient air. And for the duration of our lives, our bodies breathe. Noticing the expansion and lift of the chest with the inhale, and the contraction and fall of the chest on the exhale. And the space, the pause, just that brief moment of pause between the inhale and the exhale, and between the exhale and the inhale. Just noticing how everything arises and falls away.
So returning to the question, what happens when we rest and invite stillness as we are doing, as we have just done, as the long darkness has been inviting me to do? One of the things I notice when I physically still my body from sitting down to meditate is just how much movement there often is in my being. In, in sitting still, it sometimes becomes apparent how little stillness there is present. The heart is beating. The breath is moving in and out, moving the torso. Thoughts continue to arise, which is like what the mind does, right? It just makes thoughts, and often thoughts of the future or of the past. And sometimes it's easy to feel really captivated by these thoughts, like planning what's coming next or like rehashing something from the past. And that I think for some time I came to meditation with the expectation that it be a certain way. Like hoping that I would sit down and grow calm and that thoughts would stop and that I could just rest in some sort of like luminous clarity. Um, and if I didn't, I felt some sort of like judgment of my experience, like it was a bad sit or something, right? And for some people, they do sit and experience a really like collected calmness. But I think for a lot of us, practice is a persistent, gentle effort to be here. Like it's a, a training to notice the thoughts and physical sensations that arise and let them be there you know, allow them to be there and to pass away without getting involved or hooked in any stories about them. Because without this practice, I feel like we often react to things that are happening without being aware of our reactions. Like, I don't know, it's pretty quiet on the street tonight but, you know, what would happen if, for example, the snow plows were going by and they were honking and loud? Like, I feel like it might be easy to, to feel annoyed or like annoyed that they're passing right now. Like, why do they need to be there now? Which, and having a reaction like that triggers a range of like physical and emotional like sensations, right, in the body. Um, as opposed to just noticing a sound, noticing its approach, it getting louder and fading away and disappearing. You know, just letting something be. So is it possible to meet experience, really any experience, without adding anything to it? Because it's adding that creates so much suffering for ourselves wanting things to be different than they are when so often we have no control over what's happening. You know, for example, like when sitting down to meditate and finding that the mind is really distracted, just noticing, huh, the mind is distracted. This is how it is right now. Can I let this be? Can I notice this? and gently guide the awareness back to the breath or to sensations in the hands or to sounds in the room. Really anything, guide the awareness back to anything that grounds you in present moment experience. 
so said in a slightly different way is it possible to open into the big sky mind that is your true nature and to welcome all experience to be there you know all of the weather <coughs> all of the clouds without pushing anything away while also being aware that everything is impermanent because impermanence is one of the really the defining characteristics of all experience right in his in his book the heart of the buddha's teaching Thich Nhat han wrote that and i quote the buddha taught that everything is impermanent flowers tables mountains political regimes bodies feelings perceptions mental formations and consciousness we cannot find anything that is permanent Flowers decompose, but knowing this does not prevent us from loving flowers. In fact, we are able to love them more because we know how to treasure them while they are still alive. And that last sentence, like, we are able to love them more because we know how to treasure them while they're still alive, knowing they're going to die and decompose. Like, I find this, these words to be so touching you know, and um, I'll share a, a recent story from my own life about this, like, coexistence of impermanence and love, um, which also includes grief, you know, all of which are really deeply human experiences that I think we can all relate to, impermanence, love, grief, you know. Um, so for the last decade, um, I have had two dear friends who are dogs, <laughs> um, sisters from the same litter. And they, they didn't live with me, but we were very tight, like definitely in the same pack. And one of these friends passed away in 2022, and the other friend passed away in October. And I was out of town, like living at a, a Zen temple in California, when I got the call that my friend was going to be euthanized that afternoon. And I felt, you know, really sad. Um, and I'd, I'd had a sense that her death was approaching, like before I left New Orleans, I like pet her and hugged her and you know, told her that I loved her and that it would be okay if she wasn't there when I returned, even though I'd really miss her. Um, and then the day came and I wasn't around and she was leaving. And um, I got to speak to her on the phone, which maybe is a little funny. Um, her main person put the phone on speaker near her head and I got to tell her how much I cared about her and loved her. And then, um, and then when I got off the phone, I asked for the afternoon off work and I went down to the courtyard to cut some flowers from a tree and um, went to the kitchen and found some scones, some leftover scones from breakfast and took two pieces and slathered them with butter because um, my dog friends really loved baked goods and butter. I knew they'd love to eat those scones. And I brought these things and put them on a little altar in my room. And I just sat there and I cried and sending as much love as I could muster to my friend, like in real time as she was departing, right? And for several days after I felt like very sad and like a little cuckoos because I hadn't, I was sleeping weird and I just felt like haggard. And then the sadness shifted into a like deep, deeply joyful love. Like it was still tinged with like an ache, you know, with a sad ache. But I began to experience a really like full hearted gratitude for all the time that I had with this dog, you know, a decade. 
And like Thich Nhat Hanh said, you know, flowers decompose, but knowing this does not prevent us from loving flowers. In fact, we are able to love them more because we know how to treasure them while they are still alive. And so knowing that loved ones will pass, that relationships end, that like everything is impermanent, it can be a call to love fully. Like I feel such sadness and such like hope about the global movement of people like rising up right now against like genocide and occupation and apartheid and hatred, you know, in defense of our like shared humanity and in recognition that like every life is precious and fragile and like everyone is deserving of safety and protection. And I perceive this really as like a movement of love and care, you know, to, to protect the living while they are still alive, right? while recognizing that life is so precarious, which it must feel so precarious in a war zone, right? And so how does this relate to the solstice? Um, I guess so in experiencing this like lengthening darkness and in like watching the leaves fall, um, I have been intuitively trusting impermanence. Like daylight's been getting shorter in a really like palpable gradual way. And even though like, I don't know for sure that the days are gonna grow longer, like I am trusting that it will, you know, that in this annual dance of shifting light and dark. And so I feel like what I'm trying to say is that in witnessing impermanence with the body, you know, in like knowing the truth of it, that like a trust can develop, like a trust in the fact that everything changes because causes and conditions are like constantly changing, right? And so when you know this, when you know like in your being that everything changes, then it makes it easier to accept when things do end, right? Like changes are not unexpected. Like each in-breath has a beginning, a middle and an end. Like each out-breath has a beginning, a middle and an end. Like each thought, each everything, right? Constantly arising and passing away. Um, our physical sensations like Tonight, some of you have probably shifted your posture, even in this like 20 minutes that we've been sitting here, right? Because you experienced <coughs> some discomfort and so you needed to move, like. And, and in practice, the invitation is just to really like pay attention to what is happening with curiosity. Um, Suzuki Roshi, the founder of the Zen lineage I practice in, has described this state of like open, curious awareness as beginner's mind, you know, very famous. Um, and he said that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in, the, but in the experts, there are few. So basically in a beginner's mind, a beginner's mind is very allowing of everything, right? It, it isn't attached or rigid about things being a certain way and it doesn't have a desired outcome. And so it's less disappointed when things inevitably change because, because desires are held lightly, right? There's like an awareness that things might change. So if you don't clutch too hard, it'll be a little bit easier. Okay, I might be going a little bit out there now, but here it goes. Um, <laughs> I felt like, anyway, so um, as I maybe alluded to, I have, um, I've just come out of three months of training at a Zen temple um, where a few times per week we chanted this thing called the harmony of difference and equality, or the Sandokai in Japanese. 
and um, it was written in southern China in the 8th century, so it's a very old thing. And reflecting on the solstice, I just like kept thinking about these phrases. Um, and they are, in the light there is darkness, but don't take it as darkness. In the dark there is light, but don't see it as light. Light and dark oppose one another, like the front and back foot in walking. I'll read that again. In the light there is darkness, but don't take it as darkness. In the dark there is light, but don't see it as light. Light and dark oppose one another, like the front and back foot in walking. And so in, in this passage, Light and dark are referring to like the relative and the absolute. And um, quoting Suzuki Roshi, right? Like light means the like relative dualistic world um, of our words, of our thinking, basically like the visible world that we live and operate in. Um, and darkness refers to the absolute to like a place beyond our words where our thinking mind cannot reach. And we are immersed in the relative and the absolute like at all times, right? So like, and hear me through with this thought because I think it, without it getting to completion, I could, I know I would feel annoyed. So anyway, so I'm gonna <laughs> just, um, so like on the absolute level, right? beyond our concepts and our ideas, we are all one, okay? So like we're all made of the same stuff. We are all impermanent. And, but on the relative level, constructs such as race and class and gender and sexual orientation have very meaningful consequences, right? Very meaningful material consequences that like divide and rank us. And we, and we exist both in this like world of our constructs where we operate day to day and we exist in this absolute way where we are all the same, right? And I feel like right now we're witnessing what I perceive as like the worst effects of the delusion of separation like in Gaza and Israel, where like are, where ideas people are clutching to are being used to like dehumanize and kill. Um, and like as Arthi talked about here in their talk some weeks ago, you know, how can we like grieve the effects of separation, right? Which are really real in our lived experience, like racism and Islamophobia and like anti-Semitism are real like people are fighting other people right so how can we grieve the separation that exists while also remembering our inherent like interconnection and our sameness on the absolute level and like continuing to have the stamina to like hope for conflict based on this separation to end right Okay, so getting back to the solstice. There is an ever shifting balance or harmony between night and day, between light and dark, between the relative and the absolute, between grief and joy. And all of this is in a dance of impermanence. Like in the increasing darkness, light is present, like, because we know the light will return. And in the light, darkness is present, and in grief, there's joy, and in joy, there is sadness. And as it says in the harmony of difference in equality, like light and dark oppose one another, like the front and back foot in walking. So, is it possible to trust impermanence, kind of whole 
wholeheartedly, you know, to trust the lengthening darkness, knowing that it is impermanent. You know, is it possible to be with what is happening right now with love and care, you know, to not push anything away while also knowing that nothing lasts? Um, as a friend said earlier today, um, impermanence is one of the few things we can rely on. And to me, somehow, this is really a relief. And so, with that, I would like to invite you to find a posture to practice in again. And this time, we'll, we'll sit for about 15 minutes. And there'll be a lot more silence this time. And I will ring a bell to collect us as we begin. So as you settle inviting an awareness that is broad and vast, vast as a horizon, beyond an ocean, Noticing what it's like to inhabit the body, heart, mind that you do at this moment.
if you find that you are getting carried away in thinking, just noticing that and very gently bringing awareness back to present moment experience, be it following the breath, noticing sensations in the hands, noticing sound near or far further away, or any other anchor that feels right to you.
so closing your practice. And preparing to return to group space. If your eyes are closed, perhaps gently open them, letting in some, some light. And um, I'd like to um, dedicate the merit of this practice together um, to um, the liberation of all beings everywhere without exception. And I'm wondering if there is anything else that any of you would like to dedicate this practice to. You know, if there's any word that comes to mind, please, yeah, please share it if you feel comfortable. So thank you all. Um, Carl, do we stop the recording for questions or what do we do? Yeah, usually we do. Okay, so bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Online. <laughs> um.